How are you doing? Yeah. Welcome. I'm so glad to have you here. Some of you guys thought I would not be here because you were looking at Facebook and saw that I posted a picture of snow and ice. And uh, yes, I was in Denver uh, this weekend. Uh, my son was visiting the Air Force Academy uh, to look at to play football there. But I am back. You can't get rid of me so easy. Hey, we have a ton of visitors here this morning. Let's give them all a big hand. Welcome. We're excited that you're here. Don't worry, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to have you stand up. But we are honored. We know that you have many choices uh, of where you could attend uh, church. And we're honored that you're here. And, and take a deep look at who we are. And uh, see if we really do love God, because we do. And see if we really do love people, because we do. And uh, we're just honored to have you. And just like the video said, if you would fill out that connection card and put it in the uh, offering baskets as we leave, we'd love to get to know you. Or even better yet, take it to the connection tent out front and uh, we'd love to give you a gift uh, for that and, and just, just want to get to know you. As God leads you to make decisions and, and if you have prayer requests, that connection card on the back is a great way to communicate it. Uh, can you see my face today? We have lights that, that uh, will illuminate uh, where I'm at on the stage, and, and we started building out a stage here from the stage, a stage from the stage, because I want to get closer to you. I, I, I would feel so far away from you back there on that stage. It's, if you don't know it, it's 22 feet. And it feels like I'm on one side of the Grand Canyon speaking to everybody else on the other side of the Grand Canyon. So we were able to get these lights. Many of you said, well, I like the stage, but I can't see your face very well. So now I have these two powerful lights shining right in my eyes so that you can see my face, okay? Uh, with that said, let me, let me just do this. We're having a little bit extra setup on Sunday mornings where we're setting up a little bit more lighting and, and this stage is heavy. If, if I could get some men that would meet at this stage afterwards, today after church, or even next week after church, meet at this stage, we want to get a couple more men involved with helping set that up. And uh, I would really appreciate it. And you know what I'm really looking for? I'm looking for four men. One to take the first week, one to take the second week, one to take the third week, one to take the fourth week, and each man build a team that will do some of this setup. That would just be amazing. Uh, how many want to say, let's start the year off right? Come on, somebody. Come on now. All right. You know, I'm talking to the men that are sitting out there that uh, would like to get involved, and this is a good way to start and uh, bring your son with you. Uh, that's fine. It would be great to have you. Uh, in the month of January, what we do is we speak a lot of vision. you got to have vision for a new year. And uh, last week, I talked about uh, from Isaiah 43, 19, about the verse that God says, I, behold, I am doing a new thing. And how many of you out there know that God needs to do a new thing in America? Yeah. Come on, somebody. I mean, seriously, can I get a better amen? We need revival in America. We need revival in Lake Nona. We need revival in Florida, in Orlando. And I'm going to tell you, it starts in the heart of Christians. That's where revival starts. You know, I don't know about you. Have you ever been in one of those seasons where you just feel like you're praying, you're praying, but you're, you just feel like your prayers aren't getting answered? Or you feel like there's this distance between you and God. Or maybe you're going through something and you're desperate. You need to hear from God. You're making a big decision. You need to hear from God. Or your family's going through something or, or there's something that's happened that, man, you just need a touch from God and you're desperate. How many of you ever felt like that or been in that situation? Well, the scripture I'm looking at today, there's a father that's in a situation that he's desperate. He is absolutely at his wit's end because his son is, it has ep epilepsy. 
And he gets these body convulsions and, and he, he, his son gets thrown into fires. His sons get uh, thrown into the ward. He almost drowns, almost burns up. And, and it, his son is so sick, he is desperate to do something. And he brings his son to the disciples and they're not able to do anything. They, they lay their hands on this boy and they pray in Jesus' name and nothing happens. It's like the awkwardness of this right here. That was awkward, right? It's like, what would have really been awkward if I would have screamed or something, you know? All right, you know? You know, when the crickets are there and you're not hearing from God. And you're desperate. I've got to have something. I've got to have a breakthrough. And you know, what, what would it have been like for this, this father who, who has seen the disciples go out and touch other people and they were healed? Now come on, think through the emotion of this. And this father generates enough faith to bring his, his boy to these disciples and he's all excited. Oh, and he's telling his son, today's the day, son. We're going, we're going to see this man's disciples. They pray for him. And nothing happened. Can you imagine the letdown of that father? Well, I'm really glad that he didn't stop there. And, and as we look at this passage, take God's word. And open it to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. And we're going to start reading at verse 14. And let me just make this plug right here. Uh, all of my notes are on the back of the worship program. But if, if you are living in the digital age, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm there yet, but I'm trying to get there. If you're living in the digital age, there is an app called Bulletin Plus. If you download that app, and then as you download it, it'll come up and, and it'll ask you a couple questions, and you can scroll down to Go Church. If you click on Go Church and save it, you'll be able to see our worship program online and digitally. And if you click on uh, look at the notes now, uh, it'll take you to my notes, and you'll have all the verses right there on your smartphone, okay? We'll also have the verses up here, hopefully, okay? So I just wanted to let you know about that. But as I read in Matthew 17, verse 14, it says, When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and, and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and, suffer, and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire, into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. I mean, a pretty desperate situation, right? And I mean, it's just horrible. And I want you to see in the next verse, in verse 17, I want you to see Jesus' response. And Jesus is, is prophetically saying, why? Why they couldn't heal him? And what was the problem? Now, now look at this, and it, it's up on, this, on screen. See? Say it with me. Let's read this next part of the passage together, what Jesus said. Here we go. You unbelieving and perverse generation. Jesus replied, how long will I stay with you and how long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me now. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Now, I don't know about you, but I, if I were sitting in your seat, I would be a little bit apprehensive right now. So Jesus said that the reason why the boy wasn't healed is because they're unbelieving and they're perverse. Yep, that's what he said. But I want you, we're not the church, don't, don't, don't get us, that we're the church to say, oh, you're unbelieving and you're perverse and you, sinner. See, as a, as a church, this is what we do. We raise our hand and we say, we're the greatest sinners of all. See, this, he's talking about me. He's talking about me today. And I struggle with this. I struggle with my unbelief and I struggle with my perverseness. 
And the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many of you know that we're in the boat together? See, we're in the boat together. And the reason why we don't have the breakthroughs that we want to see God do in our community, right here in this school, in, in Lake Nona Middle School, in North Lake Park Elementary School, in Moss Park Elementary School, in, in Narcusi Community School, in our community, in our community, things are not happening spiritually. The way we want to see them happen is because of this right here. There is no one else to blame but us, the church. He's talking to the people here, and he's specifically, I think, he's really setting an example and talking to his disciples. And he's talking to the followers. Everybody is watching this situation. Look at verse 19. It says, Then the disciples came to Jesus in private. Why in private? They were embarrassed. It's like they're looking at their hands. Where's the power? I, I, you know, where's, where's the... I'm, they were embarrassed. And they asked Jesus, why couldn't we drive it out, the demon? Why couldn't we drive the sickness out? Why, what, what was the problem? And notice how Jesus answers the question. He says, he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you had the faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing will be impossible with you. How many of you have ever prayed in a mountain moved? A few times, maybe. But I... It's like there's this expectation that Jesus gives to the disciples and he's given to us that we have got to live in a zone where there's faith. And when we live in that faith zone, there is a power that, has, that is given to the believer that can move mountains. And, and it, we know that we're not just talking about a literal mountain. I saw some literal mountains. I saw Pikes Peak in Colorado Springs, and, and I saw the Rockies, and they were snow-capped, and they were beautiful. It was amazing this weekend. And I was thinking about this passage. Move! <laughs> I was thinking about it, and I was thinking that in my heart. Mountain, move. But how much more important it is to see people come to know Jesus, to see people put their marriages back together, to see people released from drug addictions and all kind of other addictions. That's the mountains that need to be moved in our community and in our neighborhood. Amen? Amen. I, I, I'm tired of living a normal life. I'm tired of just going to church. I'm tired of just the same old, same old. And in 2015, I'm asking for a breakthrough to a whole nother level. So what about you? How about you? Are you? Are you trusting God for something new? Are you trusting God for something in your kids? Are you trusting God for something in your marriage, something in your finances, something with your neighbors in your life group? Are you trusting God for some great things? If you're not, why aren't you? Maybe, maybe we need to analyze, have we given up? Have we just became melancholy? And are we like the, the frog in the kettle? Just, just blending into our circumstances and as the heat is warming up, we don't even know it. We're being cooked to death. See, as Christians, we lose our sensitivity to what's going on and we lose our belief in believing that God would do great and mighty things. And it's time for us, it's time for me to come back and say, God, no, 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 I'm not going to just give up. I'm not just going to give in. I'm not going to accept the normal. I want something great from you. 
You know, when you look back at verse 17, I want to break down that unbelieving and perverse generation. What does that mean? Because that can be taken a, a, a lot of different ways. And, you know, some people have taken verses like this and kind of kind of used them in the wrong way. The reason why you're, you're in your situation because of your lack of faith. I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that, you know, and I don't think Jesus is saying that. here's, Here's what the unbelieving part means. An unbelieving situation is a situation, what Jesus meant is that unbelieving and doubting is because you're not connected to me. So what unbelieving is, is a disconnect with God. That's what it is. Fill in that blank. Unbelieving is not connected to God. That's what it is. Because when we're connected to God, we do have that belief. When we're connected to God, we have a a stronger faith and a stronger confidence. Well then, what is this perverseness? What is the other side? See, part of the problem is that we're not connected to God, and perverseness is too connected to the world. So so the perverseness is being too connected to the world. And I'm going to tell you, it is so easy to slide into that situation, isn't it? I mean, you let your God down just a little bit, and you're there. I mean, well, we're going to go to the, and, and watch this movie. It's okay. It's okay. It's not that bad. Or, or you know, you, you click on one site on the, on the internet, and it takes you to another site, and, 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 and all of a sudden, you just kind of slid into looking at some things you ought not look at. I mean, you want some entertainment, and you start watching this on, on, the, uh, video, uh, on the TV, and, and all of a sudden, you're hooked into a series that really a Christian shouldn't watch. Or maybe, maybe uh, you're on Facebook and, and you're going through and, and maybe one of your friends uh, posted a video and at the bottom of that video there's some more links and it leads you to a place you, don't, you shouldn't go. We let down our guard at times. And, and I want to be honest. Let's be honest. December is a big time for that. I mean, we are, we're thinking, well, I got to get my kids all this stuff so that they, they fit in. Can I tell you, we need to stop trying to fit into this world because we're not of this world. We're children of God and he wants us to soar over this world and not be of it. We're in it, but not of it. Anybody with me? That, that in it and not of it needs a better amen. Somebody give me a better amen. That you are, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are not just a normal person. You are a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What does that make you? It makes you a princess. It makes you a prince. You are royalty and you are are not of this world anymore. Your social security number has changed and your address has changed. Your DNA has changed. You are a child of the king, and we have got to be different. You know, the problem is I'm not connected to God. That's unbelieving. And I doubt, and and I just don't have the connection. And the problem is is that I'm too connected to the things I ought not be connected to. You know, I can't tell you that. I can't tell you what it is, but I'm going to tell you what. God is giving you a, a director, a guide to tell you that's the job of the Holy Spirit. It is the job of the Holy Spirit to convict you of how you have connected too much to the world and to convict you that you're not connected enough to God. But so many times, don't we push away the prodding of the Holy Spirit? You know, we have prayed over every seat in this room. We have prayed and asked God that the Holy Spirit would speak to to you today. Are you open? Are you listening? Are you surrendered and wanting to hear from God? If you want to hear, you will hear. I can't tell you, but He will. He'll tell you what's going on. He will convict you of that. See, 
In this passage, Jesus not only tells us about the problem, but he tells us about the solution. And this is so cool. And I can, I can give you testimony and testimony time again. The church got started. Because in verse 21, and, and, and it alludes, maybe in your Bible, tw- verse 21 is missing. Look in your Bible, is it missing? Well, if you do, at the end of verse 20, there's a, a, a letter, A, B, or C, or whatever. And, and that letter is for you to look at the bottom of your page. And it says, some manuscripts has this. And that some manuscripts, maybe your Bible says it has the same thing as, as Mark chapter 9, verse 29. And this is what Mark 29, 9, 29 says. It says, Jesus replied, this kind can only come out through prayer and fasting. It's like Jesus said, you want the keys to the kingdom. You want, you, you want the truth. You, you want the solution. Well, here's the solution. Prayer and fasting. Now, let's, let's think about that answer. Let's think about that solution. With prayer, what does prayer do? Think about it. Prayer connects us with God. So prayer is the answer to the unbelieving part that we need to be more connected to God. We need to spend more time in prayer. Spend time in focusing, talking to God. Well, if young man, young lady, if you want to get to know someone, if you want to start dating someone, what do you do? If you want to build a relationship with someone, well, you go and talk to them. You spend time communicating. The same with God. You have got to talk it out. You have got to communicate. And that builds that that relationship stronger. And then, you know, you know, I was thinking about this. You know, the people that you are closest with, the people that you trust the most, the people that you have the most confidence in. It's the people that there's been a time that you have gone to another level in your communication with them. You've told them things about yourself that other people don't know, right? I mean, come on, think about it. They just know a little bit of more information about you. It's not just the the casual talk. It's not just, Father God, thank you for my food, bless it to my body, in Jesus' name, amen. No, No, really, it's funny, but... That's the communication that most Christians have with God. See, when we're talking about prayer and fasting, we're saying take it to a whole nother level. That you are, instead of eating, you're spending more deliberate time seeking God and talking to Him and communicating with Him. And that works. The more time you spend with Him, the closer you get. And the more time you spend with him, the more your sensitivity becomes to hear him. See, this is one of the things that I take out of this, Tim. You know, when, when I get so busy in ministry, and I'm helping so many people with their needs, and I'm doing all this and that, and, and I'm so busy, sometimes what fails is my time talking with him. Does anybody know what I'm saying? Anybody, anybody getting anything out of this? Amen. See, when, when, when my time with God wanes and, and I start getting too busy, you know what happens? My power goes. See, I can't just give, give, give in ministry. I must plug into the power source so that I have the pressure the power, the, the stuff that I need for my day to minister. And that's what every Christian needs to do. That's what I need to do. It's what we need to do. We need to plug into the power of prayer and our connectivity with God. You know, uh, for, for these lights to be shining in my eyes and for you to see my face, there has to be a power source. They can't do it on their own. They have the capability. They have the potential to light up the room just like you do, but you have got to plug into the power. And the way we plug into the power is through prayer. Amen? Amen. Well, what's the fasting part do? 
Isn't it interesting that Jesus said the reason why you disciples weren't able to cast out this boy's demon and heal his sickness is because some only come through prayer and fasting. Can I tell you, there's some levels that God wants us to get to that we can't get there unless we pray and fast. See, if you're looking to, to bring down some struggles in your life and you need a breakthrough and you're not finding it, maybe it is that you need to pray and fast. <coughs> maybe that's the solution to your problem, our problems. You know, it was, it was 10 years ago, next month, we moved here. And about six months before that, I was going through a, a really tough time that I was just really uneasy in my spirit. And I, I was experiencing the best ministry of my life. And all of the things that I was praying for, all of my dreams were coming true. I mean, facility-wise, I mean, with numbers, with, with workers. I was a youth pastor, and we were just seeing incredible ministry happen. Just, just building a camp facility, uh, getting a new uh, room to, to meet in and, and just being able to get into the schools and see great things happen, the relationship. But there was something going on in my spirit that I couldn't explain. There was just this heaviness. And I, 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 just, I just seemed like I, I don't know. Have you, this is how I explain it. Maybe, maybe you have been there. I feel like I was running as fast as I could and all of a sudden I hit a wall. And I just kind of shake my head, scratch my head, get back up, and I try to take off running again and hit the wall again. It's like I couldn't break through it. It's like there was this pressure that I just couldn't get through. And God led me into a fast. And, and spending more time in prayer and just asking, just being desperate, God, I've got to hear from you. And you know what he did? He revealed that the heaviness and, and, and the lack of connection and the lack of, 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 of just really being able to experience the success that I was having and being happy about it is that he was calling me out to plant a church that would eventually become Go Church. Do you realize, brothers and sisters, that Go Church was birthed in a time of prayer and fasting? That that was when your pastor heard from God that I need to step out. I don't know where you're leading me, God. I need to step up and I need to step out and I need to start something that's new in a community that is new, that needed a church. And after much prayer and fasting, God led me to Lake Mountain of Florida. A country boy, farm boy from Virginia gets led to Orlando, Florida. Are you serious? I would never have guessed in all of my life that God would bring me here. Are you serious? See, God's ways are not my way. It's no way I could have known growing up that God would call me to be a pastor. I mean, and you know what? Here's a story. I went to a Christian school to play football, and uh, there was, I was kind of the top athlete in our high school. And, and I had that, they named me that in the yearbook, most athletic. And the girl that they named most athletic, she got a scholarship to go to like William and Mary College and I got a scholarship to go to Liberty. And she asked me, we, we were good friends. She said, did you know that was a Christian school? Said, yes. And she like asked me, are you a Christian? I said, yes. But she didn't know it. People didn't know I was a Christian. I was kind of like this undercover Christian. I mean, nobody in my high school would have ever guessed that Barry Rice one day would be a pastor. Why are you amening? That's not funny. No, I'm just teasing, I.B. No, I mean, seriously, nobody would have guessed. I would have never guessed. But I'm going to tell you what. If you would have asked my grandmother, who prayed for me every day, 
and ask God to work in my heart. Ask God to protect me. Ask God to do something in my life. I guarantee you that she prayed it. This 92-year-old woman who wore a stocking cap to my football games and brought an old cowbell and shook it at the football games that embarrassed me to death, that prayed for me every day and was believing something great for my life, I guarantee you ask her, she believed it. After God called me into the ministry, I, I got my education. I become educated and, you know, got my seminary degree and, and I took my first job. My first job was in Stark, Florida. It, don't try to find it. It's hard to find unless you're speeding. There, you'll find it then. And I was a youth pastor there. And as soon as I got there, within a couple months, they wanted to ordain me because I wasn't ordained. Do you know my 92-year-old Grandmother said to her daughter, you're going to drive me to Florida, and I'm going to see that young man be ordained. She rode in the car 12 hours, and she was fussing the whole way. I've got to get there. Don't you make me late. <laughs> and she came, and, and she was in the service that I was ordained. See, God's ways are not our ways. Could it be that God wants something that is not even on your radar? Right, Abby? Now, now we know why you said amen. That was not even on your radar that God has something so big, so special, so dynamic just for you that it may only be revealed through prayer and fasting. I'm talking about those type of things in 2015. That God gives you a breakthrough. That God calls you to come to, to do something great. So Jesus tells us that some spiritual breakthroughs only happen through prayer and fasting. If you feel like you're running up against a wall and getting knocked down, running up against a wall and getting knocked down, maybe it's time for you to have the faith to say, God, I'll pray and fast. And, and we're starting today. I've already started. We're starting today a 21 days of prayer and fasting. I am going to be at Wycliffe Bible Translators every day at 6 o'clock if anybody wants to pray. And I'm not talking about 6 o'clock p.m. I'm talking about 6 o'clock a.m. I am going to pray every day for 21 days at 6 a.m. at Wycliffe Bible Translators. Why there? Because that's our office and there's a lot of godly people that pray there. If, if man or woman, if you want to meet and, and, as a group and pray and ask for those spiritual br breakthroughs together, I'll be there. I'll be there. But I'm asking you not only to pray with me. I'm going to ask for your family, for, for your relationship with God, to break the bonds of connection that we have with the world so that it, it stuffs us up. It's like uh, earwax in our ears so that we can't hear from God. That, that, that we break the perversity in our life, in our community. We not only pray, but we fast as well. Because fasting breaks the grip of the world on your life. That's what it does. That's what fasting does. It breaks the world's grip on your life. Let me, let me give you a couple verses here. In Matthew chapter 9. John's, the Baptist disciples, is coming to the new disciples of Jesus, and he's asking Jesus this question. It says, then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? They're asking Jesus, why don't your disciples fast? And notice what Jesus said to him. How can the guest of the bridegroom mourn? while he is with them. See, he was saying that the time right now is not to fast, but notice what he does say. The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And then notice the statement. Then they'll fast. Sometimes you have to be taken to desperation. Do you believe that the disciples were desperate when Jesus was crucified and, taken, and arrested and taken away from them? And they thought everything was over? 
That was desperation. I, I pray that you're not put in a situation of desperation so that you will fast. I pray that you'll choose to fast and, and that you are desperate already. I pray that nothing big and bad and, and, and the rocks have to fall down the cliff on top of your car to get you to pray and fast. And notice, notice uh, that, that Jesus started the church age, and, and, and when the church age started, when he left and he gave them the great commission to, to go and make disciples, that's your name of your church, by the way, go make disciples church, go church. And, and notice what the church was doing in Acts chapter 13. The whole book of Acts is, is what the church did in the beginning. So Acts chapter 13, look at it. In verse 2, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and, everybody say? Fasting. And fasting, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit speaks through fasting as well. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Did they go out immediately? No. Notice what happened. So after they had fast and prayed some more, they placed their hands on them and sent them out. Isn't that interesting? That the church was on a regular basis about prayer and fasting in the beginning. Well, what about Paul? Notice, notice what Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. 27. He says, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, and it says, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. He was talking about the price he paid to start the churches, that the churches that were started in Ephesus and Corinth and, and, and uh, Colossus and, and uh, Philippi, that they were started through times of his prayer and fasting, that where he went on his missionary journeys was directed by his times of fasting and the Holy Spirit directed him. So it's, it shows that the early church was all about prayer and fasting. But let, let me explain it even more. Why you and I need to fast. See, we are a triunity. We are triune. That's the way we're created because why? We're created in God's image. What is the image of God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Just like there's three parts to God that is one God, we have three parts that is one person. We have a body. Right here you see a body. It's not that great looking, but I do the best I can to dress nice and fix my hair and all. But anyway, I have a body and you have a soul and you have a spirit. There's three parts to you. A tree has how many parts? It has one part. You haven't heard a tree laugh, have you? See, a tree just has a body. It, it's just one part. What about animals? They have two parts. They have a body and a soul. Well, you see a dog wag his tail when he comes home. When you come home, I mean, hopefully. And, and when it's done something bad, it tucks its tail. It has, see, the soul is your emotions. It's, it's how you relate to others. Your body is how you relate to yourself. It's how you connect to self. Your soul is how you connect to others. It's your emotions. So therefore, your spirit is where you connect with what? Yeah, it's where you connect with God. And that's why the Bible says those who don't have a relationship with God, they're spiritually what? Dead. They're spiritually dead. And when you become a Christian, God puts his spirit inside of you so that you can have a connection with God and you become spiritually alive. I know you're thinking about the big question. Does animals go to heaven? They have a body. They have a soul, but they don't have a spirit. I don't, know, I don't know if they go to heaven. Our spirit is where we connect with God and we go to heaven. I can tell you this. I know cats don't go to heaven. <laughs> Maybe dogs. I'm not going to get into it. And don't you email me if you're a cat lover. I, I, I don't know why God created cats. Maybe to keep the mice, the mice population down. I don't know, but they're an awful animal. But see, we are body and soul and spirit. But here's an important question. 
Which one is the strongest in you? Are, is your body the strongest? For most of my life, that's what it was. And I spent most of my life building my body to, to be strong. You know what? If your body is the strongest, it cancels out everything else. You know, that's why men are not emotional. And, and it stands in the way, if we're only body strong, we, we, it stands in the way of our... Maybe your, your soul is the strongest and, and, and you're in tune with your relationships with others. That's why you want to spend all of your time on Facebook because of these connections. That's why you spend all of your time on the phone. That's why you can talk on the phone and do 25,000 other things at the same time. I mean, you can drive and text and call and, and do all this. It, Sometimes because your soul is, is the strongest. And if your soul is the strongest, it's, you are driven by feelings. And you can't always trust your feelings. It's, it, it's not about your body and your connectivity to yourself. See, if you're all about your body, it's about pleasure and comfort for you. If you're all about your soul, it's about relationship with everybody else and people and, and how they're going. That defines you. And what the body and the soul really becomes is idols in your life and hurts your connectivity with God. See, when you're connected with God and your spirit is what stands up in your life, it overrides your body and your soul. You're not, you're not, you're not directed by your feelings and you're not just directed by your, your body what you want in pleasure and comfort and, and your connectivity to yourself. Well, I want... That's your body. The, the soul is, is, is your feelings and your connectivity with others. Is that making any sense? Which, which is strongest in you? And as a Christian, to, to disconnect from the world, this perversity, and to disconnect with, with the things that are distraction, we got to build our connection with our spirit connected to God. That's how we overcome these, these problems with our body and our soul. So what do I need to do? We need to do what Jesus said we need to do. We need to pray and fast. And, and I believe starting off the year with a, a time of prayer and fasting will, will tune your, your, your sensitivity to God. So that you can hear from him the things that he wants you to do. It doesn't matter. Our plans. we got to get our plans and connect it with his plans. So that we can be where God wants us to be. When he wants us to be there. And do what he wants us to do. Amen. You know where it says that then you will know his will. See when we're connected to God. And we have crucified the flesh. Romans 8 talks all about this. Romans 8 talks about the battle between the flesh, the body, and, and, and the, the soul with our spirit. That they are at war with one another. Remember those passages? That we need our spiritual man to step up. Well, what I'm asking you to do, and I've asked you last week to pray and consider. Now I'm asking you to do what God has told you to do. And to start a 21 day of prayer and fasting, the first thing we need to do is we need to set an objective. Let me, let me, let me tell you what my objectives are in this prayer and fasting. Number one, my objective is this, to declare my dependence on God. See, a, a wise man told me once that how much you pray determines how dependent you are on God. And if you're praying little, you're saying, God, I got this. I don't need you. To come to a time to recalibrate my prayer time and fasting with God. I am stating, my objective is to communicate to God. I am in this over my head and I need you. I, I can't make it without you. Number two, I'm asking for forgiveness. I'm asking him for how I have allowed our relationship to, to slide. I'm asking him to forgive me of how I've overeaten, 
over the holidays. We need, to, we need to ask some forgiveness about some debt maybe we've had over the holidays. Maybe we need to ask him to forgive us about something we've seen on TV or we need to get our, we need to ask the Holy Spirit how have I offended God and get forgiveness. See, my objective is to recalibrate my focus on the eternal. Because I keep sliding into just focusing on the now, the pleasure for the now, the now, what, what I want right now, instead of thinking about eternity and being eternity focused, instead of focused on the now, I need to recalibrate and refocus on eternity. My objective in my prayer and fasting for these next 21 days is to invite the presence of God into my life. I will spend extra time in, in just personal worship, playing some worship songs. I, you should hear how beautiful I sing <laughs> to God when I'm by myself with Him. Why are you laughing? It's not that funny. I know I can't sing a lick, but when I'm alone with God, He tunes me up. And I just want to invite His presence in my life. I want to walk and live in His presence. It's so important. And then to believe God, my objective is to believe God for some specific answers to prayer. That I'm, I'm not only going to take some things to God and ask Him to show me, but I'm going to believe that He's going to answer. And I'm, gonna, and I'm not going to give up, I'm not going to let go until, until He gives me those answers. See, there's three things. The first one is you've got to set an objective. Secondly, we have to decide what kind of fast you will do. I'm not calling all of you guys, but some of you need to, need to fast all day, every day for those 21 days and not eat. You need to drink water only, or maybe you need to do a juice fast. But you need to hear from God how He wants you to pursue Him in this fast. Maybe you need to fast from Facebook. Maybe you need to fast from Coca-Cola or Pepsi or Mountain Dew. Or some of you, it's the harder stuff. No, no, yeah, I'm getting up in your grill now. Some of you, the hardest stuff is these energy drinks. Or maybe it is liquor or alcohol. Seriously. What does God want you to let go and fast from? I've, I've sent most of you, uh, you, you're on our email list. I sent you a link to, to look at from the great website that crew does that talks about prayer and fasting and different kinds of prayer and fasting read that seek God and ask him how do you want me to fast really hear from God and do what God don't feel bad that you're not doing what I'm doing be obedient to God and ask him how do you, how does he want you to pray and fast and then number three how to initiate this set him objective Choose what kind of fast you're going to do. Maybe it's a Daniel fast that you're only going to do juices. Maybe, maybe it's a juice fast you're only going to do juices. Maybe it's a Daniel fast you'll do vegetables and, and fruits. I don't know. But number three, expect results. Expect to hear from God. Expect to get closer to God. Be hungry and thirsty to do it. Let me close with with what I think the results will be from you. In Isaiah chapter 58, the whole chapter is about fasting, and I wish I had time to go through this whole chapter with you, but in, in verse 8, it says that there's three things that's going to happen. It's, it's three then statements. Then you'll be able to do this. Then this will happen, and then this will happen. He promises that at least three things will happen when we fast and pray in verse 8. It says, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your, everybody say it, and your, and your healing will appear. You will find healing in these 21 days of fasting. Number two, he says, then your, say it, then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Wait a minute. That you are going to, if you pray and fast, that you are going to, a loom, you're going to shine this righteousness. What is righteousness? It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. It means that you're going to be holy as He is holy, and you're going to be set apart, and there's going to be a righteousness about you that is just unique to the believer of God. 
So you're not only going to experience healing, you're going to experience holiness. And lastly, I'm closing with this. Verse 9, it says, then you will call and the Lord will, say it, he will answer you and you will cry for help and he will say, here I am. So you will get an answer. You will get help. I am believing that you will have a breakthrough with God. Do you need one? You may not know that you need one, but you need one. Your family needs one. And can I tell you, this church needs a breakthrough. This community needs a breakthrough. And I know it starts with me and it starts with you. Are you with me? Yes. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Would you just bow your eyes and close your head? <laughs> bow your heads, close your eyes. I always say that in it. Dadgum it. Close your eyes and bow your head. What is God saying to you? Dear God, I just offer myself to you. For the next 21 days, I'm going to seek you with all my heart. I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better man of God. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. And God, I want to be a better leader in this community. And God, I pray that you'll help me. God, help me to seek you. Help me to hear from you. I want healing. I, I, I want to be holy as you are holy. I want to be set apart. God, I need your help. If that's you in this room, would you just pray a prayer similar to that? How many would raise their hand and say, Pastor, I, I need that. Would you agree with me in prayer? Would you raise your hand this morning? I, need, I want to break through with God, and I am committing to this time of prayer and fasting this morning. Would you raise your hand? I see your hands. God sees your hand. God, would you just lead these people? Would you bless us? Would you guide us? Would you direct us? Would you anoint us? Would you touch us? Yes, God. Give us a breakthrough. Give our community a breakthrough. Give this church a breakthrough. If you're here this morning, and what the Holy Spirit is tugging on you, your heart is palpating, you're you just want some hope and you know that it's because you don't have a relationship with God. You don't know whether or not if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. You don't know what this stuff is all about. You just know you need it. If you're here today and you're, you're, you're wanting a connection with God and you've never had it, there's three things you've got to do. You've got to admit that you're a sinner. And what sin is, listen to me, what sin is, is living life for yourself and not for God and doing what you want to do instead of what he wants you to do. That's sin. We've all sinned. You've got to admit that you have offended God. Number two, you've got to believe for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You must believe that Jesus died for your sin as payment for your sin. You must believe that Jesus was buried, that he was the son of God, and that he rose again the third day. You must believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven because he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. So you must believe in Jesus and put your trust in him to get to heaven and nowhere else. Not in church, not in your family, not in being good, but in the goodness and greatness of Jesus. You must believe in him. And lastly, you must make a commitment to follow him and to take Jesus as your Lord, Master, and Savior. And the way we do that, as Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
If you want a relationship with God today, would you call out to Him through prayer? Let me help you. Would you say something similar to this? Dear God, I need your help. I thank you for making me. I know that you want a relationship with me, but I'm admitting that I'm a sinner. And I've gone my way, not your way, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Dear God, I, I believe in your son Jesus. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he was buried. I believe that he rose again. And I believe that he's alive. And so Jesus, because I believe in you, I'm putting my trust in you, and I'm inviting you into my life to take over. I surrender to you and your authority. Tell me what to do. I will follow your will to the best of my ability, and help me to do that. Come into my life right now, and make me your son. Make me your daughter. Save me. Make me a child of God right now. I surrender all to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to congratulate you if you prayed that prayer. The Bible says, and you can trust the Bible, it says that if you believe in His Word and you uh, receive Him as your Lord, and if, if you uh, confess Him as Lord and Savior, that He'll come into your life and He'll save you. That if you profess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart, God raised Him from the dead, the Bible says you shall be saved. So I want to congratulate you, and I want to welcome you into the family of God, and I want to celebrate with you. If that is you all over this room, would you just lift up your hand? I prayed that prayer, and I meant business with God, and I invited him to come in and take over my life all over. I see those hands. God bless you. That's awesome. Amen and amen. I want to pray for you. Would you also fill out that connection card? Would you let me know by checking that box? I pray to receive Christ. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for how you're moving in this room. We just sense your presence right now. We sense that you're moving, that you're healing people even now, that you're helping people even now. And Lord, I praise you for those who gave their life to you today. May they let it be known to us. May they take a stand. May they dig in and join in and be a part of this great church, Lord. And just surrender themselves to it, Lord. Would they tell somebody today so that they could celebrate it with them, Lord? But God, we just call them into this family and we just, we just thank you for them. And we're excited about what you're going to do in their life. And Lord, as, as you're about to work in a mighty way and you are working, we just want to celebrate you and love you. And thank you for all you're going to do. Help us with this fast. Help us to come closer to you as we pray. Help us to know you in a deeper way. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand to our feet right now. The band's going to lead us in a song. And as the Lord leads you, would you just come to this altar as God leads you? If you need prayer, you come to this altar. You just do what God calls you to do. But let's Let's just, just give ourselves over to Him right now as we sing. Let's just, let's just enter into His presence. Let's just lean in. Let's just be obedient to Him. And let's just thank you for all He's done today. Amen. Anybody experience some freedom today? Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. Just step into that freedom that God gives you today. And let's just worship Him right now. Lead us, man.